Hello, and welcome to another Knights in the Classroom video. I'm Sir Matthew, and Lady Andrea will be doing our dramatic readings today. So today's video is all about swords. Why? Because they're cool. We're going to specifically be talking about swords in literature. Ever since humans have been writing things down and recording things or writing novels or books, they've been talking about swords, even back to the Epic of Gilgamesh. In this video, we're going to discuss a number of different texts. Uh, we're actually going to read to you from the texts, and then we'll show you the swords we happen to have in our collection. The first one we're going to start off with is Excalibur. Now, Arthurian legend is vast. There are over a hundred novels that mention both Arthur and Excalibur, and we're going to read from one that we happen to have in our collection. Something glinting in the sunlight caught his eye. He trotted over to investigate. The answer to my prayers, he told himself, seeing a very large sword sticking out of a big block of stone. The square was empty. The guards had all abandoned their posts to go to the tournament. Without bothering to read the inscription on this stone, Arthur clambered up, grasped the handle in both hands, and gave it a sharp tug. As smoothly and silently as a snake leaving its burrow, the shining blade slid from the stone. Arthur stood for a moment, staring at his amazing find, before glancing quickly all around to make sure he wasn't being watched. Then he leapt down and sliced the crisp morning air with a sparkling blade in a furious, imaginary fight. All of a sudden, he remembered that the tournament was about to start, so he hid the sword under his cloak and galloped back as fast as he could. Here's a sword, he said, holding, out, holding it out to Kay. I couldn't get yours, but... Kay recognized the sword immediately, and before Arthur could finish his sentence, he had snatched it from him, tucked it under his own cloak, and rushed off to look for Sir Ector. That's Arthur's father. Look what I've done, Kay said excitedly when he, he found him. It's the sword from the stone. I pulled it out. I must be the true-born king. Sir Ector gave Kay a quizzical look. Well, if you can do it once, you can do it again, and this time you'll have an audience, he said calmly. He insisted that they all ride straight back to the cathedral, even though he knew they would miss the tournament. Every time Arthur opened his mouth to try to tell Ector what had really happened, Kay silenced him with a menacing glare. Back at the cathedral, Ector marched them straight over to the stone. Now, put the sword back exactly where you found it, Kay. Kay jumped up onto the stone and tried to thrust the sword into it, but failed miserably. It's strange that you could pull it out, but you can't put it back, said Ector. Kay climbed down, shamefaced. Now tell me where you really got it from. From Arthur, said Kay, not daring to look his father in the eye. And where did you get it from? Ector patiently asked, turning to Arthur. From the stone, I promise, babbled Arthur frantically. I tried to get Kay's sword, but the door was locked, and, and I knew he'd be cross, and I saw the sword, and I didn't want him to miss the tournament, so I took it, and I... Calm down, Arthur, said Ector. Now let's see if you can put that sword back. Arthur took the sword from Kay and clambered up onto the stone. The blade slid back in like a warm knife into butter. Sir Ector then climbed up next to him and tried to pull it out. He failed. Now it's your turn, Kay, he said. Kay jumped up and seized the handle. He pulled and yanked and heaved, but had no more luck than his father. Finally, Arthur, still not able to understand what all the fuss was about, climbed up, grabbed the handle, and once more, effortlessly pulled the sword from the stone. When he looked down, much to his surprise, his father and brother were kneeling in front of him with their heads bowed. What are you doing? He asked, kneeling before our king. Read the words on that stone, Arthur, and you'll see that there's only one person alive who can pull out this sword, and he's our true-born king. What do you think? Could I be the one true king? Let's find out. This is my first sword, and it is beautifully weighted, it's wonderfully crafted, and uh, I'll leave you to do your own research on Arthur, because we don't have any 
absolute fact at this point. Some would suggest the sword is not the right style, it should look different, uh, as it would have been from the early medieval period, not the late medieval period, but it is beautiful. It has a nice fuller down the center, which makes the sword lighter and stronger, and uh, I happen to have my own paper mache stone. And Bilbo took a knife in a leather sheath. It would have made only a tiny pocket knife for a troll, but it was as good as a short sword for the hobbit. Then the great spider, who had been busy tying him up while he dozed, came from behind him and came at him. He could only see the thing's eyes, but he could feel its hairy legs as it struggled to wind its abominable threads round and round him. It was lucky that he had come to his senses in time. Soon he would not have been able to move at all. As it was, he had a desperate fight before he got free. He beat the creature off with his hands. It was trying to poison him to keep him quiet, as small spiders do to flies until he remembered his sword and he drew it out. Then the spider jumped back and he had time to cut his legs loose. After that, it was his turn to attack. The spider evidently was not used to things that carried such stings at their sides or it would have hurried away quicker. Bilbo came at it before it could disappear and stuck it with his sword right in the eyes. Then it went mad and leapt and danced and flung out its legs in horrible jerks until he killed it with another stroke. And then he fell down and remembered nothing for a long while. There was the usual dim gray light of the forest day about him when he came to his senses. The spider lay dead beside him and his sword blade was stained black. Somehow the killing of the giant spider all alone by himself in the dark without the help of the wizard or the dwarves or of anyone else made a great difference to Mr. Baggins. He felt a different person and much fiercer and bolder in spite of an empty stomach and he wiped his sword on the grass and put it back into it, its sheath. I will give you a name, he said to it, and I shall call you Sting. So now we are talking about Sting from The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Uh, this would be the visual representation from the Peter Jackson films. And uh, Sting itself is supposed to be a short sword. Basically it's barely the size of my forearm, so it's pretty accurate as far as that's concerned. Uh, there are many different historical texts that could show you what an Anglo-Saxon uh, dagger might look like, which would be pretty much a lot like this. Maybe not as ornate, but that is part of the whole uh, mythological aspect or fantasy base of the elves themselves who actually made it. And of course, it's supposed to glow blue if works are present. The sword of Elendil was forged anew by elvish smiths, and on its blade was traced a device of seven stars set between the crescent moon and the rayed sun, and about them was written many runes, for Aragorn, son of Arathorn, was going to war upon the marches of Mordor. Very bright was that sword when it was made whole again. The light of the sun shone redly in it, and the light of the moon shone cold and its edge was hard and keen. And Aragorn gave it a new name and called it Anduil, Flame of the West. And now we have Narsil, before it's shattered in Lord of the Rings, or Anduil, or Flame of the West. It is a gigantic sword. It's one of my largest swords in my entire collection. Again, it's from the Peter Jackson film series, and Aragorn would have wielded this. Um, I'm sure they had much better balanced ones. This one is just what we call a wall hanger, but it is absolutely gorgeous and would be a two-handed sword. The snake's tail whipped across the floor again. Harry ducked. Something soft hit his face. The basilisk had swept the sorting hat into Harry's arms. Harry seized it. It was all he had left, his only chance. He rammed it onto his head and threw himself flat onto the floor as the basilisk's tail swung over him again. Help me, help me, Harry thought, his eyes screwed tight. Help me, please. There was no answering voice. 
Instead, the hat contracted as though an invisible hand was squeezing it very tightly. Something very hard and heavy thudded onto the top of Harry's head, almost knocking him out. Stars winked in front, in front of his eyes. He grabbed the top of the hat to pull it off and felt something long and hard beneath it. A gleaming silver sword had appeared inside the hat, its handle glittering with rubies the size of eggs.